And a very good morning to you. Good morning. Hope you're well. It's morning here in the UK anyway. Sunday, March 11th, 2018. I hope you've had a good weekend. My name is Richie Allen. This is Sunday View. I am observing Twitter. If you want to tweet me, do it between now and the end of the programme. It's at Richie Allen Show. Couldn't be simpler. Couple of things happening. I'll tell you about those just before we kick off. The BBC is reporting you will have been following the Russian spy story, Sergei Skripal and his daughter, who were found slumped unconscious this day last week. There's been all sorts of allegations as to who might have been behind it and all of that. Well, the BBC, and we, we will talk about it shortly. The BBC are reporting right now is that up to 500 Salisbury pub goers and diners have been told to wash their possessions as a precaution after nerve agent traces were found. They are saying the trace amounts of the substance used to poison the ex-Russian spy and his daughter were found at the Mill Pub and ZZ Restaurant. The chief medical officer, officer for England is a woman called Professor Dame Sally Davies and she said the risk of harm was low. But they're saying anybody who was at the venue after 1.30 last Sunday needs to wash all their possessions. Is this overkill, do you think? Is there a bit of overkill, a bit of scaremongering going on? I don't know. Anyway, welcome to Sunday View. With me, Richie Allen, live right now on richieallen.co.uk and multiple platforms around the world. Asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on richieallen.co.uk. Fab Radio 2 in Manchester and TriggerWarning.tv Yeah, a bit of scaremongering going on there. If you were in Salisbury last week, you might be a bit scared. Sunday View then with me, Richie Allen, looking at the Sunday newspapers here in the UK and some of the stories in there as well. Headlines next. It's the Richie Allen Show, broadcasting live on richieallen.co.uk and multiple platforms around the world. And now, here's your host, Richie Allen. Yeah, I suppose anybody who was at any of those venues last Sunday probably a bit nervous this morning. I don't think you have to be that nervous. Lot to talk about. We're we're going to have we're going to dive straight into the front pages of the Sunday newspapers, the broadsheets, and the tabloids as well. Different stories. Not so much Brexit stuff today. I know, I know. There's Brexit fatigue. In fact, I don't think there's anything. We're not going to talk about Brexit today. Uh, full stop. Right. That's a promise. By the way, my Mancunian-based listeners, the Irish community's St. Patrick's Day parade takes place today in the city. Yeah, I know. St. Patrick's Day is next Saturday. I know. But for whatever reason, probably down to logistical reasons, the, the parade is later today in the city. I won't be attending. I haven't the energy for it, to be honest, and the lunacy of it. And the temptations to have a few points of the black stuff or the green stuff today. I won't be doing it, but the parade is in the city centre today. And for more details on that, just go online if you want to partake in the festivities. There is a very large Irish community in this great city. There has been for many years. So there you are. Next Saturday is St. Patrick's Day, Paddy's Day. But today the parade for the Irish Manchester Association. Right, the Sunday Times... The headline on the front page of the Sunday Times is Tories break May's vow to ban Russian donors. You won't be surprised to learn that there are lots of Russian-themed stories in the news today, not any of them flattering. None of them are flattering at all, in fact. So the Times writes that Russian oligarchs and their associates have registered donations of more than £820,000 to the Conservative Party since Theresa May became Prime Minister. May promised to distance her party from Russian donors when she took office with allies briefing that she would sup with a long spoon. And the Prime Minister insisted there would not be a business-as-usual relationship with Moscow. However, the party has declared donations worth 826000 £100 from Russian-linked supporters since July of 
2016. Last night, Theresa May was under pressure to return the cash over the attempted nerve agent murder of the Russian former spy Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia in Salisbury last Sunday. May is under pressure from senior cabinet colleagues, apparently, to do a lot of things. It's been claimed that she's under pressure to take a stance, or a stand even, against Russia in the wake of the alleged poisoning. Proof doesn't matter. Here's Sky News' Laura Bondock this morning. Senior members of the Cabinet are frustrated at the moment. They think Theresa May could have taken a tougher stance and are pushing for her to do so so far. What could that be? Well, the Sunday Telegraph says that ministers have agreed to adopt a US-style regulation which will give the government the power to uh, impose uh, visa bans, to freeze UK-based assets of any Russians. The newspaper says that the Foreign Secretary, the Home Secretary have agreed in principle to, to bringing in uh, Magnitsky-style rules here. This is nothing new. There's been a push for this for some time from Tory backbenchers and Labour as well. They were hoping to amend a piece of legislation that's going through Parliament at the moment. And no doubt what's happened in Salisbury will add fuel to that argument. It's worth noting, though, that when the US and Canada changed their rules to bring this in, Russia did retaliate. And in the background to all of this as well, the Sunday Times today reporting um, that the Conservative Party received over £820,000 of donations since Theresa May became Prime Minister from Russian donors. Now, this is something Theresa May said she wanted to reduce. Um, the paper saying that they've received that number of donations. There's nothing wrong there. The Conservative Party says it, it declares all donations. There's nothing illegal there. But I think what it does underline is just the difficult decisions and steps Theresa May will have have to consider carefully as she moves towards her next decision in all of this. Mm. So since July 2016, £820,000 and change coming from various Russian donors. The upshot being, according to the media, Russian money corrupting UK politics and UK democracy. Dear listener, join me together, join me, and together we will Enjoy a chorus of You've got to be shitting me, right? On the count of three now And a one, and a two, and a three You've got to be shitting me, right? Russian money Corrupting UK politics Russia has no influence In this country whatsoever Obviously very wealthy Russians Very wealthy Russians Live in London and elsewhere Very wealthy Russians But so do wealthy Saudis Wealthy Israelis, we'll come to the Israelis in a minute, and others. But the UK is a member of NATO, which is camped on every Russian border with missiles pointed at the Russians. Russia is fighting ISIS in Syria while the UK is arming the lunatic jihadists. And the money we're hearing, the sums of money, are paltry. Let's have a conversation about foreign money influencing our government this Sunday morning, just for a few minutes, Israeli money. Let's talk about Israeli money and how the Conservative Friends of Israel and the Labour Friends of Israel organise and funnel millions of pounds to the Conservative and Labour parties. What a laugh today that not one newspaper has the guts to include a mention of the all-powerful Israeli lobby when mentioning that foreign money is corrupting UK public life, foreign money coming from Russians. It is a joke, not to mention the Israelis. And back in 2009, the brilliant journalist Peter Oborn made probably the most important documentary of the last decade, maybe Adam Curtis's The Power of Nightmares might argue with that. But for Dispatches, Channel 4, Peter Oborn made a film called Inside Britain's Israel Lobby. And I want you to listen to a couple of clips if you want to hear about the influence of foreign governments on domestic and foreign policy here in the UK. You're first going to hear Sir Richard Dalton, who's a former UK ambassador to Iran, and then you'll hear Peter Oborn himself. Listen up. 
What's unique about the pro-Israeli lobbies is that they have such good access to politicians. They often operate behind the scenes and they have primary regard, even though they may come from Britain, not to the interests of the British people, but to a mixture of what they see as British interests, but the interests of another country. Aside from raising cash, some of the pro-Israel lobbies in Parliament also pay for and arrange trips to Israel. They have sent almost as many MPs and candidates on trips to Israel as have been made by all MPs to the United States and Europe combined over the last eight years. Two years ago, the CFI took 20 parliamentary candidates to Israel. When they got back, 10 of them received donations totaling £30,000 from CFI sponsors. 10 of them got £30,000 each from CFI sponsors. That was around £300,000 on the back of one trip, right? Think about it. 10, 300,000 quid, one trip. We're talking about Russia, 18 months, various oligarchs donated £826,000. Over the years, these Israeli lobby groups have funneled millions and millions of pounds into UK politics. Here's a little bit more from Peter Oborn's dispatches inside the UK's Israeli lobby. Here's how the lobby uses its influence at the highest level of British politics. Three years ago, Israel invaded Lebanon in retaliation for Hezbollah's attacks into northern Israel, during which two Israeli soldiers were killed and two kidnapped. During the Israeli invasion that followed, 1,000 Lebanese civilians were killed and an estimated $3.6 billion worth of the Lebanese economy was destroyed. William Haig had recently been appointed Conservative Shadow Foreign Secretary. Some 21,000 in donations were sent to him by CFI board members, including hedge fund billionaire Alan Howard and again Richard Harrington. I don't believe, and I don't think anybody else would believe that these contributions come with no strings attached. On July 20th, Haig made a speech. In it, he called the Israeli response disproportionate. And I think we can say, in response to the question of my right honourable friend, that elements of the Israeli response are disproportionate, including attacks on Lebanese army units, the loss of civilian life and essential infrastructure, and such enormous damage to the capacity of the Lebanese government, does damage the Israeli cause in the long term. Moderate enough, you might think, but Lord Carms, a leading CFI donor who owns Dixon's and was treasurer of the Conservative Party, was outraged and threatened to withdraw funding to the party. Sir, William Hague's usual good sense has deserted him. Think again, William, for whom do you speak? Your comments are not merely unhelpful, they are downright dangerous. No further donations were received by William Haig from CFI board members. Yeah, the, the boss of Dixon's at that time, anyway, I'm not sure if he still is the boss of Dixon's, saying, think again, William Haig, the shadow foreign secretary, for whom do you speak? Funds were cut off. And by doing that, the Conservative Friends of Israel and the Labour Friends of Israel were able to censor hundreds of MPs because of their actions against William Haig say that we're being disproportionate and we'll cut off the dosh. Now, Haig was an idiot. They weren't being disproportionate. The Israelis were being typical. They were slaughtering, murdering hundreds and hundreds of innocent people. That's what the Israelis do. Now, that was back in 2006, remember. David Cameron had just become Conservative Party leader at that time. Haig was his shadow foreign secretary. Cameron wasn't prime minister yet. Have a listen to this. This is, this sums it all up. We've learned that after William Haig's speech, the director of the CFI, Stuart Pollack, had a meeting with David Cameron, at which it was understood that terms such as disproportionate are not the sort that conservatives should use to describe Israeli military action. And then last June at the CFI lunch, David Cameron didn't mention Gaza at all in his speech. He said... I look around and I see some of our biggest donors and a special thank you to you. 
Yes, I look around and I see some of our biggest donors. So what did that lead to then? This was 2006, 2007. What did it lead to? It led to complete silence during um, so-called Operation Cast Lead, 2008, 2009, over the winter, and Operation Protective Edge in 2014, which saw the Israeli slaughter thousands and thousands of Palestinians. Slaughter them in an open-air prison where they have nowhere to run. Silence. Because the CFI, the LFI and other groups basically run UK politics as their sister groups in the United States like APAC and others run US politics. That's a fact. It's not conjecture. It's not conjecture. It's not anti-Semitism. It's a fact. So to see newspaper stories today talking about 826 grand coming in from a variety of Russian oligarchs, some based in London, some not, as being detrimental to and a serious threat to democracy in this country is a laugh. There is no democracy in this country. There's never been democracy in this country or any other country. And you've only got to use that example, the Israeli lobby. All right, we're leaving that for a minute. 16 minutes past 11, Sunday, March 11th. Also in the Sunday Times and on the front page of the Sunday Times, by the way, and this will boil your arse on this mothering Sunday. Happy Mother's Day to the mothers listening to the programme, by the way. Happy Mother's Day, mummies and mammies and moms. Mother's Day cards go gender neutral. That's the headline. Mother's Day cards go gender neutral. Jesus, Mary and Holy Saint Joseph, I hear you say. And this is about Waitrose, a supermarket chain here in the UK. They started selling gender neutral Mother's Day cards. And the cards say, Happy You Day. And the reason for this is to be more transgender inclusive. As I say this, my transgender listenership and I've got transgender men and women listening to this programme, they are groaning and I don't blame them. Waitrose has dropped the M word from some of the Mother's Day cards it sells and replaced the wording wording with Happy You Day as part of its range on offer to shoppers. Waitrose said we want to broaden out who the cards can go to, whether it's grandmothers or transgender mums. Traditional cards are still being sold by the chain, The supermarket isn't the only retailer to have offered a wider selection of cards than your traditional Happy Mother's Day cards. Or to the best mum in the world, Happy Mother's Day. No, we have to be gender inclusive. Here's broadcaster Emma Bullimore. She was on Sky News talking about this earlier today. Gender neutral Mother's Day. Yeah, so this is Waitrose. They found their way onto the front page of the Times because... They're trying to expand their range of Mother's Day cards. Obviously, it's Mother's Day today. They don't want to offend anyone. We we never want to offend anyone. Uh, So they're saying to be aware of transgender issues, they are releasing cards that just say Happy You Day, which I think is a shame. Actually, you know, if you're transgender and you are fighting for society to accept you... You'd love to be called a mother, Exactly. You You, you want to be, you know, if you're trying to transition to being a woman, you feel that you are a woman and were born a woman and therefore would like to be referred to as, as a, a woman. Exactly. Yeah. So I yeah. think this is extremely patronising, actually, happy for you day. Just, happy that, you What does that even mean? Happy You Day could be every day. So for me, that there should yeah. be a you yeah. section if that's what you like. But then today is Mother's Day. If you don't identify or you don't want that, then please just don't buy the I Mother's do think day from the, you, they should talk to transgender people about that. Mm. It, you know, yeah, it's just presuming that they know how they feel about issues. Um, yeah, that they actually don't. Have, well, but that they don't want to have a gender. There are people who have sort of gender fluid and all that sort exactly. of thing. But transgender people want to have. A, yes, they're identifying a gender. Exactly. But it's not just not just transgender. Because another suggestion here for for Ricardo, I think, is is in print. Two mums are better than one. So that's another type of. Yeah, family. and I think well, that's, that's great. Right. That's fantastic. Yeah. You know, but uh, yeah. No, it's not fantastic at all. I would argue it isn't fantastic that two mothers are better than one. It's not great at all. Free speech is fine, by the way. Emma Bullymore and the other contributors there, they can say whatever they want. I, I, I do believe that. But a public broadcaster surely has a responsibility to bring on somebody who doesn't think it's great that two mothers are better than one. They're not. Mark Collett, who's been on this programme of late, my guest last week, is right. The nuclear family 
is being diminished in terms of its importance and it's being diminished by a cultural Marxist media. Now, the Times reports that some trans activists are calling for the renaming of Mother's Day, that some trans activists want it to be called Guardian's Day or Carer's Day. But you see, I don't believe this. I don't believe that trans folk give a rat's arse about this. It's not coming from your neighbouring um, trans woman or trans man. It isn't. They have quoted somebody called Karen Pollock, a trans campaigner and therapist apparently, who says, Mothering Sunday feels more inclusive to me since anyone can be mothering. Some schools, according to the Sunday Times, including Consett Junior School in Durham and High Bank School in Livers Edge, which is in West Yorkshire, they've marked the event on their websites as Special Persons Day or Mothers and Special Persons Day. This is some load of bollocks, isn't it? The news comes after Coca-Cola redesigned its Diet Coke cans to be gender neutral. Because they were gender specific before? I don't remember noticing. The soft drink giant is targeting men and, pe- men and people who are non-binary, meaning they do not exclusively identify as masculine or feminine, instead of its more traditional focus on women. Yeah. Again, I don't believe for a minute this is the agenda of trans folk. I don't buy it at all. There's no evidence to suggest that trans men and and trans women are getting together to say, let's inflict this monumental bollocks on people. It's coming from cultural Marxists, progressives, the sort of people aligning themselves with groups like Momentum, Labour. It's not coming from trans people, but it's very dangerous. 21 and a half minutes past the hour. We'll look at the Sunday Express. Next, we'll look at the Telegraph newspaper, uh, the Mail on Sunday. This is Sunday View with uh, me, Richie Allen. Thanks for joining me, by the way. Thanks for being there. Good to be with you. It's not a bad day here in South Manchester. It looks pretty nice outside. Uh, The future Mrs. Allen assures me it's very mild. She's been out walking uh, the dog today. She's on dog walking duties. When, uh, when I do Sunday View. Back in a minute then with the Sunday Express and plenty more. Introducing the H2O app, a powerful water structure and application that programs vibrational energies into water through the use of different sound frequencies. Once programmed, the use of water for drinking, cooking, bathing. Give it to your friends and colleagues or spread it around the garden. The list goes on. It's not just water that the app can be used for either. It's great for programming crystals too. The H2O app is free to download and is available on both Android and Apple platforms. For further information, go to h2oapp.online. There's a place high in the mountains of Spain, a sanctuary where souls gather from all around the globe to learn about themselves and experience powerful changes in the way we see our world. They become awakened to their gifts and their power to heal others. Become part of this ever-growing worldwide family of unique, pure energy healing practitioners. Discover how amazing you truly are. Go to www www.markbayerski.com It could just change your life forever. Have you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone, or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information, or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies, and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS, and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. The Richie Allen Show relies on your support. Go to richieallen.co.uk and set up a monthly donation today. Welcome back to the most listened to independent radio show in Europe. It's your Richie Allen Show. Welcome back. Happy Mother's Day. It is the 11th of March 2018. This is your Sunday View broadcasting live right now. 24 and a half minutes past 11 it is and there are quite a few tweets understandably on this let me get into some of the tweets there hi to uh, Gail hi to Chris there Andy Dunbar late of Salford University how you doing Andy nice to know you're listening mate 
first time listening in a while, he says, says Andy, great show, mate. Happy special person's day to you, mate, says Andy. Andy's a Liverpool fan, so he won't be in the best of form after Liverpool rocked up to Old Trafford yesterday and um, dominated a lot of the game, I think, against Manchester United, but didn't create too much. I think a draw might have been about the right result, Andy, but David De Gea didn't have very much to do. I think United probably just about deserved it as well. Nice to know you're listening, my friend. Andy Dunbar there, Liverpoolian listener. Um, Liz tweets about, did anybody ask the Coke bottle what the Coke bottle wanted to be identified as? Yes, Liz. <laughs> it's getting as silly as that, isn't it? Um, cartoon Drunk tweets, um, Holy Mother of Jesus, gender neutral Mother's Day cards, that's madness beyond belief. Father's Day cards. We'll soon have a picture of cross-dressing dad on the card. Maybe. Maybe that's uh, something that will happen. Good morning to David Stanford. Morning, David. Soon to be in the demolition man world, Richie, wiping our bums with seashells and being fined on the spot by artificial intelligence. Yep. Certainly the latter bit. Sean McDonald tweets, pissing myself, laughing, happy you day, as in E-W-E. Go down well in Yorkshire, says Sean. I see what you did there, Sean. Um, yeah, <laughs> it is getting ridiculous, isn't it? And I to BJ's, who's listening to the programme on the east coast of the United States as it approaches 8 a.m. there, well, 7.30 a.m. there. Thanks for reminding me, BJ's, by the way, that the clocks went forward in the United States overnight. So I, I need to keep that in mind as I book guests from the US this week. Um, so cheers for that, mate. Good stuff. Keep the tweets coming in. It's at Richie Allen Show. Good morning to Base Ninja. At Richie Allen Show is how to tweet me as we go along. And we'll, um, we'll, um, I'll read those uh, tweets out. Tweets out even as they come in. Let's look at the Sunday Express. The headline, Spy Poison in Parcel. They can't make their minds up whether the man, Sergei Skripal, and his daughter were poisoned at the restaurant, whether they were poisoned at the cemetery when he was visiting his wife, or whether they were poisoned by a parcel. They don't know. So it's really more speculation in the Sunday Express. It's a free-for-all, as you know, dear listener, UK media offering nothing but wild speculation as to the method and wild accusations with no proof whatsoever. But Martin McCauley is a journalist and Russian expert. Um, I like Martin McCauley. I only met him today. I didn't meet him. I met him through the medium of television. He was on Sky News and he had this to say about Theresa May, a possible response from May, but also about the proof or lack of around accusing people as to who did it and who didn't do it. Martin McCauley. And it's very unfair to say that uh, Theresa May... Uh, has responded very limply and so on. Well, that's that's the right uh, reaction because there's no proof. Mm. They have to first of all identify the nerve agent and where it was produced. Is it a new one? Uh, there's only about three or four countries in the world which could produce it. And you don't open your mouth until you know which one it is. And then you have the, the problem of deciding, was it a state action? Or did somebody steal it? Or was it uh, for, uh, corrupt? Uh, individuals who acquired it and so on, and then carried out this attack on Skripal because he had uh, done something uh, which their group, their gang, didn't like. So it could be, you're saying it could be potentially criminal involvement? You have all that. You have three theories. One is it was Putin who gave the order. Uh, secondly, it was somebody at the very, very top who, in fact, was, was giving the order uh, uh, hoping that Putin would okay, that that's the right thing to do, but he didn't give the order. And thirdly, that it is to embarrass Putin. It is a scandal and it will denigrate him and uh, it will uh, damage his legitimacy in the eyes of the, uh, the, the West one week before the presidential election next yeah. Sunday. He's good, isn't he? Isn't he, Macaulay? He's good. Yes, Putin's opponents, qui bono. I never studied Latin, by the way. I was lucky enough that Latin teaching had stopped in Irish primary schools. Thanks be to Jesus. Who benefits? Look, there are a number of groups who stand to benefit from the embarrassment of Vladimir Putin. That's not to say that any of these groups did it, because you can't emulate the mainstream media 
while criticising them at the same time. It's good stuff by McCauley. Yes, the Russians might have done it. They might have done it. Kremlin, F- FSB might have done it. There might have been somebody in the FSB who, when he knew McCauley, might not have been at a very high rank and then might have graduated to a high rank and he might hate McCauley, uh, uh, he might hate Skripal and might want to bump, bump him off. That's a possibility. But there are people who stand to gain and benefit by the constant demonization of Russia too. That's the way it is. So that's good journalism. These are the possible outcomes, but you've got to finalise that. Rubber stamp that by saying, we don't have a clue. Now, the Russian embassy is tweeting like Donald Trump. That's going to go into the Oxford Dictionary at some stage. Tweeting like Trump. That's when you tweet angrily at those who have offended you in some way. So the Russians have tweeted. This is good. This is a tweet from the Russian embassy. What a coincidence. Both Litvinenko and Skripal worked for MI6. Berezovsky and Perepisilny, sorry for that pronunciation, shall I do that again? What a coincidence, tweeted the Russian embassy. Both Litvinenko and Skripal worked for MI6. Berezovsky and Perepilchny were linked to UK special services. Investigation details classified on grounds of national security. Now this is a brilliant bit of tweeting by the Russian embassy they're pointing out. Is that Berezovsky and Perepilchny and Litvinenko, Alexander Litvinenko and Skripa all worked for UK Special Services MI6. However, any police investigation has to reach a has to reach a cul-de-sac because the police are not allowed access files held by MI6. So the Russians are making a great point, right? Very good. But of course, this has not been picked up by UK media today. 29 and a half minutes to the top of the hour. Let's have a look at the Sunday People newspaper. Now, we don't often pay much attention to the Sunday People because there's usually a picture of a girl on the front with enormous blue eyes or brown eyes. So we don't often pay attention to those stories. But they've gone big on the sensation this morning. Their headline is Eight Targets on Putin's hit list. Eight targets on Putin's UK hit list. Who are these people? They must be absolutely shitting themselves. Am I on the list? Are you on the list? Are you on the list? Let's have a look inside the Sunday people to see if you're on the list. If you're on the list, well, you're going to have to run and hide. A Russian spy who defected to Britain today reveals he was also poisoned and claims that he is on a hit list of eight targets that Vladimir Putin wants dead. There you are. Boris Karpichkov says that he survived an assassination attempt but lost nearly five stone and all of his body hair. He's an ex-KGB major and he has said that he has learned of seven other people, including Sergei Skripal, that Russian President Putin wants to execute. You've got to love the language of the Sunday people. I'm going to read you a little bit. In a terrifying development. Terrifying. Karpichkov says he has been warned to watch for weapons disguised as e-cigarettes, but which conceal deadly nerve gas. Somebody's been watching old 60s episodes of Batman, right? Watch out for those e-cigarettes that the Penguin used to have um, that might conceal deadly nerve gas. Now, there is no substance to this story by the Sunday people. This is this ex-KGB major telling this stuff to the people, giving no evidence, and the people, Sunday people, is just printing it. He says, I'm 59, but I'm not optimistic about seeing 60. He's named, and the Sunday people have named the others on the hit list allegedly giving to him this guy Karpichkov who said that he's uh, not going to see 60. They've named Oleg Gordievsky, who's now 79, Bill Browder, 53, Christopher Steele. We've heard all about Christopher Steele, haven't we, in the news lately? 53, Igor Suchagin, Suchagin, S U T Y A. G-I-N, Igor Suchagin, Yuri Schwetz, Vladimir Retsun, alias Viktor Suvorov. And these guys are apparently on a death list. 
that Putin, people that Putin want dead, dead. Karpichkov says he learned of his death sentence on his birthday in a chilling warning from an ex-colleague. Now this is truly awful journalism by the people because to allege that a man wants to kill eight other men, to name those men without offering a shred of evidence to support it, is not only deeply irresponsible journalism, but also potentially harmful. This is where the Press Complaints Commission should get involved and fine the people heavily enough that the people doesn't do this sort of garbage again. This is very dangerous. Are you saying, Richie, that you know better? No, I'm not. I don't know. But the Sunday people doesn't know at all, and it's printed this bullshit, just printed it, as if it's true. Right? Crazy. Naming these people. Some of these people are very old. Like the the, the, the first name. Oleg Gordievsky, he's not very old. Jesus, 79 is not old, far from it. Right? But he's getting on. And he might have health problems. I don't know, he's 79. Right? And hearing this news that they're dropping like flies in Salisbury and you're on a list, well, it, it might it might harm him. Dreadful. All because the lady loves anti-Putin propaganda. Now, I don't like Putin. You've heard me say my piece on oligarchs in the past and, you know, the Sochi Olympics and all of that, but this is dreadful. Now, Shadow Chancellor John McDonnell was on the Andrew Marr show this morning. And Andrew Marr asked him about what will be done about Russia. And one of the things Andrew Marr had the gumption to say to him was Marr said to McDonnell, Labour's John McDonnell, will you stop appearing on Russian state TV or T? How dare Marr? So presumably John McDonnell, big, strong, gruff, hard man, John McDonnell, real socialist, presumably he told Andrew Marr, when he was asked would he stop appearing on RT, presumably John McDonald said, um, you go and fuck off, man. I'll do whatever I want, right? Well, this is what McDonald said. Have a listen. I think that's right now, and that's what I'll, I'll be doing. I've appeared on it in the past, sometimes to challenge some of the issues internationally yeah. and also to raise issues here um, that we're concerned about in terms of, well, not just Russia's role, but also the international scene overall. And I think that's right, because I think from what we're seeing from Russian today at times, goes beyond objective journalism from what I've seen. So, yes, I think that's right. Wow. Yes, I think it's right to stop talking to RT. You absolute coward, John McDonnell. You wretched, miserable coward. How could you not say to Andrew Marr, who works as a ridiculously high-paid presenter for a state broadcaster that has been proven by the London School of Economics whatever you think about them, to be skewing the debate on Brexit by inviting 66% of pro-Remainers on programmes as opposed to 33% of people who want to leave the European Union. How could you sit there and listen to that garbage from Andrew Marr and not nail him to the wall? He agreed with him. Yeah, yeah, I won't be. Instead of saying to him, I'll speak to whoever I want to speak to. And maybe it's an opportunity if I'm invited on to RT to talk about issues, to challenge RT about electoral interference and all of that. Why ignore them? Why ban them? Why censor them? No, Andrew, uh, John McDonald said, yeah, yeah, it's good, yeah, yeah, I think it's about time we stopped talking to them. Do you want to hear more of this because it gets worse? You're, this is a change in, in direction. Peter O'Dowd, your deputy, was on Russia Today only yesterday. Are you going to be encouraging the rest of your colleagues to follow that lead? Yes, I am, because I'm, I've been looking overnight at some of the what's happening in terms of changes in coverage on Russian television in particular, and I think we have to step back now. And I can understand why people have up until now, because we've treated it like mm. every other um, television station. We've tried to be fair and making sure that, again, any country's television station, we try to be fair with yeah. them. And as long as they abide by journalistic standards, which are objective, that's fine. But it looks as though they've be gone beyond because that line. So, yes, we'll, we'll be having that discussion. I mean, with respect, it was never really like any other television station, was it? Tom, what... It was never really like any other television station, was it, said Andrew Marr. Then he mentions 
Tom Watson. Tom Watson. Tom Watson, the deputy leader, said uh, that Russia today was reporting false or inaccurate stories and aligned its editorial policy to that of President Putin's Russian state. And, and the BBC is doing that every day, reporting false editorial stories. And the BBC has lined, aligned itself with the Zionist state of Israel. You see, McDonnell has no balls. When McDonnell was a backbencher, he would have been saying stuff like that privately. The cheek of the BBC, the pro-Israel BBC, the pro-Brussels, pro-establishment BBC. But McDonald just sits there and says, yes, 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 you're right, you're right. I think we'll have to stop talking to RT, yes. And that was back in November. Yes. At times there's been examples of that and I think now we need to take those into account, especially in this current climate, and that's what we'll do. Oh, you wretched bastard, McDonald. Absolutely unbelievable. A BBC presenter earning in excess of a million pounds a year for scratching his arse and not asking questions, not holding authority to account. You could do that, dear listener. You could do that. You could sit on the sofa there, not ask any questions, wear a nice suit and get paid in excess of a million pounds a year. And he's telling McDonald, you shouldn't be speaking to these people. McDonald is saying you're right to a pro-establishment, cultural Marxist, bedwetter like Andrew Marr. How absolutely dreadful. Let's move on to the Sunday Telegraph. No let up on Russia. The headline, Corrupt Russians Face UK Visa Ban. You heard the clip from Laura Bondock at Sky earlier on. This is all about sanctioning Russian officials involved in corruption or human rights abuses. I'm not going to say any more. We talked about it earlier. The Mail on Sunday. Shame of the Bono charity bullies. Ah, Bonio. We were only talking about Bonio last week. This is about you too, singer Bono. He's got a charity called One. He's got another charity called Red as well. And he's apologised to the Mail on Sunday after claims of bullying and abuse emerged at the charity One, which he co-founded. Among the allegations are that one female worker was demoted after refusing to become intimate with a foreign government official. The woman's manager reportedly made sexist, sexist and suggestive comments about her to the official. Bono told the Mail on Sunday newspaper, We are all deeply sorry. I hate bullying. Can't stand it. The newspaper said the charity publicly admitted the issues hours after it had sent a long list of allegations at the end of an investigation in order to allow one to comment. Gail Smith is the CEO of the charity and she sent the statement and said former employees had notified the organisation earlier this week about pending legal action over their complaints. It said historical issues of mistreatment emerged in November when some former employees from its Johannesburg office told their stories on social media. Bono's charities are a front, are a front for massive pharmaceutical companies and corporations to inflict vaccines and other terrible medicines on the peoples of third world countries. Now whether Bono is aware of that or not, I don't know. I can't say he is or I can't say he isn't. But that's what these charities are there to do. They're not there to help. I'm telling you. Looked into them and I've done extensive programmes on these issues with people in the past. Dreadful. Absolutely uh, dreadful these charities and, and the idea they're there to enrich the lives of and to educate people in third world post-disaster countries, famine, weather. No, 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 no. They are about getting NGOs in there, foundations like Billow, Bono's groomer, Clinton, and Bono and others to rape, to loot, to pillage all the natural resources of those countries and to medicate the people of those countries. That's a fact. It's a fact. It's not conjecture. Sunday Observer. Top paid men outstrip women by four to one. Shock figures reveal. There's almost four times more men than women in Britain's highest paid jobs, according to uh, The Observer. Um, fair enough. The star on Sunday. The headline is Shameless Tina 
faces jail over Venables' leak. Now, they're not saying that Tina is shameless. This is the actress Tina Malone, who starred in Shameless, which is one of the most successful sitcoms of recent times, Channel 4. TV presenter and actress Tina Malone could be questioned by police after she shared an online post which allegedly included pictures of child killer John Venables as he looks now. A court injunction bans Venables' new identity from being revealed. Now, I can understand the emotion around the Jamie Bulger murder and why it's still so emotional today. I really can. Tina Malone, I've seen her on television. I've seen her being interviewed about various things about austerity and stuff and she seems like a very intelligent woman she is in deep trouble here I think if it is true that she did share an online post with a recent picture of John Venables she could be in serious trouble serious trouble they don't take stuff like this very lightly let me tell you whatever you think of Venables who's been jailed again because he's been dealing in child pornography I mean what the fuck is wrong with this kid, he was ten when he murdered uh, when he murdered Jamie Bulger with his um, with Robert Thompson. Uh, am I getting them mixed up? Am I? I might be. I don't know. I think Venables went back to prison recently, didn't he? Am I right? I think so. I could be wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, drast, terrible. Something has gone terribly wrong there in their during the, the, the time they were incarcerated at the Young Offenders Institutions. What has gone wrong? Anyway, some people will say they're evil anyway. The Sunday Mirror for front page headline, Worst Ever Child Abuse Scandal Exposed. This is a big story. We might get into this in the coming week. The Sunday Mirror investigation talks about, they call it Britain's worst ever child grooming scandal. They say it is worse than Rochdale, worse than Rotherham. Um, hundreds of young girls raped, beaten, sold for sex and some even murdered. Uh, up to a thousand children could have suffered in Britain's worst known abuse scandal where sex gangs targeted girls as young as 11. Uh, this is in Telford, by the way, the town of Telford. Uh, they call it rape hell of vulnerable young girls in Telford. It went on for 40 years. The Sunday Mirror alleges it was ignored by everybody. By everybody, they say. It's a massive story in the Sunday Mirror. You can read it online. It is free to read online if you want to get into it. The Sunday Mirror has looked into this for 18 months. They say social workers knew about it. Police knew about it. Everybody knew about it. But for a number of reasons, including the racism reason, they were scared of being accused of racism because many of the groomers in Telford or the groomers in Telford uh, come from an Asian background. Massive story this in the Sunday Mirror today. We'll get into it in uh, the week, if we can, if we can get comment on it from people involved. Twelve and a half minutes to the top of the hour. Very quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about Jesse, the body, Ventura, and climate change after these messages. Introducing the H2O app, a powerful water structure and application that programs vibrational energies into water through the use of different sound frequencies. Once programmed, the use of water for drinking, cooking, bathing, Give it to your friends and colleagues or spread it around the garden. The list goes on. It's not just water that the app can be used for either. It's great for programming crystals too. The H2O app is free to download and is available on both Android and Apple platforms. For further information, go to h2oapp.online. There's a place high in the mountains of Spain, a sanctuary where souls gather from all around the globe to learn about themselves and experience powerful changes in the way we see our world. They become awakened to their gifts and their power to heal others. Become part of this ever-growing worldwide family of unique, pure energy healing practitioners. Discover how amazing you truly are. Go to www www.markbayerski.com It could just change your life forever. 
lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone, or other storage device. Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information, or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies, and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS, and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. Asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on richieallen.co.uk. Fab Radio 2 in Manchester and TriggerWarning.tv. The Richie Allen Show relies on your support. Go to richieallen.co.uk and set up a monthly donation today. Thank you for listening to Sunday Views. Thank you for joining me. Delighted. Huge, uh, massive amount of comments on Twitter today. I think it's uh, about the most vocal the Twitter followers of the programme have been since um, we started Sunday View, actually. There's a lot of tweets on uh, a lot of issues there. Um, the Mr. Jeff on Twitter. How you doing, Jeff? UK MSM pushing US Zionist narrative re-Russia. They certainly are. Uh, Jeff, they're talking about Russian money in UK politics today. It's laughable, not to mention the Israeli lobby. Uh, good morning, Karen in Glasgow. God's sake, what a coward. Uh, he should have told Mar to fuck right off, says Karen. And that's exactly what she says. Proper Glaswegian there. Get in there. Woman after my own heart. Maybe a politician should stop speaking to the state broadcaster, BBC, says Karen. Absolutely right. But of course they shouldn't, Karen. We, we should never criticise them for behaving in a way and then endorse that behaviour. I understand where you're coming from, but, you know, to, 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 to ban uh, the BBC or to turn your back on the BBC, BBC and say, well, I won't do an interview with them. You know, it's just what the establishment wants is what they want, you know. Hi to Angela, by the way, uh, my Italian friend. Good morning, Angela. Uh, these are the damned as well. Do tweet at Richie Allen Show. Put Richie Allen Show all one word where it says search Twitter and you can see if you press enter what other people are tweeting to me. My great friend and colleague uh, Jean Ann Crowley is listening in Connemara. It tells me the weather is fine there. It's apparently lovely in uh, Connemara this morning. A lovely bright day uh, there as well. Good stuff, right? And finally, this is the and finally of the programme today. It's, 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 a, it's an interesting one. Jesse Ventura, who I interviewed one time. It was on Talk Radio Europe back in my Spain days. And I interviewed you. It was an interesting interview. It was fun. He had a he had a book out about conspiracy theories. And I interviewed him. And it was okay. It went pretty well. We uh, argued about one or two things. But it was good. At least from my point of view anyway. Now Ventura, the body, the former wrestler, the former Navy SEAL. Not sure he was a Navy SEAL. I think Jesse likes to exaggerate his resume a little bit. But fair enough. Who doesn't these days? Jesse says that man-made climate change is happening. Jesse says, and this is what I mean, Jesse says, there's a song, right? Jesse says 97% of scientists say so and the other 3% are effectively frauds paid for by oil, coal and gas. Jesse, what happened to you? I think Jesse Ventura has always bought the climate change garbage. Here he is anyway, Jesse, saying 97% of scientists say climate change is man-made and the other 3%, well, they're just, well, they're just telling porky pies. And you were, you were supposed to hear Jesse there. Let's try that again, this time with the fader in the vertical position. Well, one of the great problems you have, Brigitte, is paid off scientists. Like 97% of scientists say that, that uh, climate change is real. Then you got 3% who don't, who are generally working for the fossil fuel industry. So you have to determine when a scientist comes out and says something, who's backing him up? Who's paying the freight for him? Now, you get to conservative and liberal on why they believe and why they don't. Here's my opinion. Most conservatives deem themselves as being very religious. So naturally, because they are this religious, they believe God controls the weather. Look at that character Emhoff or whatever his name is in Oklahoma. He doesn't believe climate change because he believes God controls all the weather. I find that personally ridiculous because why would God then be so vicious? 
Why would God bring these hurricanes, these floods, these burn, burn out of control in, in, in California and all this and kill and murder innocent people? I don't buy that. It's because God does not control the climate and these conservatives need to wake up to that fact. But good luck because they're never going to not believe what they believe when it comes to religion and God. Now, it comes down to being very simple, simple science, and that is this. The more carbon there is in the air, the higher the temperatures will be. <clears throat> That's not true. This is, it's staggering that the RT presenter, it's a woman, a young woman, I don't know who she is, so I can't. She could be very, very new. And when we are very new, we do make mistakes. She never challenges him. The 97%, this is important. If you're going to have an argument with somebody about climate change today, tomorrow or next week, pay attention, dear listener. The 97% statistic first appeared back in 2009, right? I've talked about this before, but it bears repeating today. It came out of a University of Illinois study. And the study was conducted by Kendall Zimmerman and her advisor, a guy called Peter Doran. So they were the first to tell us that there was a 97% consensus. University of Illinois, woman, master's student and her advisor. Now they came to this conclusion by, by doing a two-question online survey. Honest to Jesus, this is all true. They had a two-question online survey survey. What were the questions? Pretty simple. Is the world warming? Number one. Two, are humans contributing to it? That was the second question. So the questions were designed to skew the data. That format. They wanted yes or no answers. They didn't want yes but or no but answers, if you understand where I'm coming from. They wanted to, they basically wanted to get a result that said nearly all scientists support the warming theory that the human that humans are doing it. Now, five years ago, early 2013, the media went mad. The media went mad, so it did, and said that it was an irrefutable fact that 97% of the world's scientists believed in man-made climate change. Why did the media do that? Two reasons. John Cook published a book in 2011 called Climate Change Denial. And Cook... He's a scientist based in Australia. He also created the blog Skeptical Science. Now, Skeptical Science, the blog, is very important here. And through the blog Skeptical Science, John Cook claimed in a paper he wrote, which was called Getting Skeptical About Global Warming Skepticism. Getting Skeptical About Global Warming Skepticism. John Cook said that he had analysed 12,000 abstracts from peer reviewed papers. And Cook said there was a 97% consensus among papers taking a position on the cause of global warming in the peer-reviewed literature that humans are responsible. Now the key line in that sentence is among papers taking a position. Keep that in mind. He said, I've looked at 12,000 bits and pieces, bits and bobs, and there is a 97% consensus among papers taking a position on the cause of global warming that humans are responsible. Now the line among papers taking a position is very important because, wait for this, this is true, I would never lie to you. And this is the very, very weak house of cards that all of this 97% bollocks is based on. Only 30% of the 12, excuse me, I must never give you incorrect information. Only 34% of the papers examined by Cook expressed any opinion about man-made climate change at all, or man being responsible at all. So only 34% of 12,000 papers expressed any opinion about whether man is responsible or not. Now, since 33% of those appeared to endorse the fact that man is responsible for climate change, what did Cook do? He divided 33 by 34 and came up with the figure 
7%. Now, you've probably found that a little bit confusing because I did when I read it. I'm not saying you're stupid, dear listener, but there was a little bit to take in there. So I'm going to say it again before we go. Cook analysed 12,000 papers. He said 97% of them or ninety or 97% of those that took a position on the cause of global warming found that humans are responsible. However, only 34% of the 12,000 actually expressed any opinion at all about whether man is or isn't responsible. And of the 34%, 33% of those only endorsed man being responsible for climate change. So this lunatic divided 33 by 34 and came out with 97% and the world's media since 2013 will tell you that 97% of scientists worldwide believe that man is responsible for warming the planet and that we are going to kill ourselves within the next 50 or 60 years. I hear you. You're saying that's incredible, Richie. They couldn't have been so nefarious, but they were. Lies, more lies, and damned lies brought to you by the Richie Allen Show Sunday View and that is it for Sunday View thanks for listening to the programme I've gone over the time which messes up the repeat schedule but there you go thanks for listening join me tomorrow where John Hamer will be among the guests tomorrow on Monday's live Richie Allen Show the two hour Monday to Thursday programme live at 7pm UK time until tomorrow enjoy Mothering Sunday enjoy Non-Binary Sunday Enjoy LGBTQ plus 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 ABC DFG Sunday, whatever it is that you want to call it. I don't mind really. Going to leave you with the lightning seeds and the life of Riley. I've been Richie Allen. Thanks for listening to Sunday View. The program will be put onto podcast real soon, and it will appear on RichieAllen.co.uk, my website. Marvelous. Have a great day. Speak tomorrow. Bye for now. Bye.